someone on the street, I apologize, hosted by the Alabama Education Lab at AL.com and the Seattle Times Education Lab. I'd like to note that this program is being recorded and will be shared by our newsrooms. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit worried that I might have just missed that intro. So let me just say this again. Hello. Thanks for joining this live virtual event hosted by the Alabama Education Lab at AL.com and the Seattle Times Education Lab. I'd like to note that this program is being recorded, it is being live streamed, and it will be shared by our newsroom. So my name is Tricia Powell Crane. I cover education for AL.com. And I'm Daniel Beekman. I'm a reporter at the Seattle Times covering politics and communities. So again, thank you for being here. We're going to get right to it. Uh, over the past few weeks, our newsrooms, in partnership with others through the Education Reporting Collaborative, have published multiple stories about how hard it is for working families across the country to get child care. For instance, in 2022, uh, more than one out of every 10 young children had a parent who had to quit turn down or drastically change a job in the previous year because of childcare problems. That burden often falls most on mothers who shoulder more child rearing responsibilities and are for, far more likely to leave a job to care for kids. We've also published several stories about communities and states working to address the crisis. And joining us today are three people with the power to impact our national conversation and help local families. I'd like to introduce Senator Katie Britt, a Republican from Alabama. She's the only current Republican mom of school-age kids serving in the Senate, a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and delivered the Republican response to President Joe Biden's 2024 State of the Union Address. I'd also like to introduce Senator Patty Murray, a Democrat from Washington. She's a one-time preschool and parent education teacher who chairs the Senate Appropriations Committee and is the first woman to serve as President Pro Tem, third in line to the presidency. And finally, I'd like to introduce Lisa Hamilton, President and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, a national charitable organization that publishes an annual data book examining states' progress on child well-being. The organization's 2023 data book examined the high cost of child care across the U.S. So, we will begin today's program with a discussion about the state of child care. Uh, it's a big topic, right? But we will open it up for questions from you, the audience. If you have a question for our guest, please drop it in the comments section with your name and where you're from so we can acknowledge you. And with that, Daniel, let's get started. All right, so Senators Murray and Britt, uh, first we wanted to ask you, how did we get to this point where it's so hard for so many parents to find and pay for childcare in states across our country? We'll start with Senator Britt and then we'll ask Senator Murray the same question. Senator Britt? Um, well, I want to start by thanking um, Senator Murray for her leadership. So she uh, started this conversation when no one was talking about it. And because she started it, I don't have to start it. I get to join it. And um, listening to her life experience, listening to the things that she has been able to do in the Senate, um, obviously show a pathway for continuing to move this conversation forward. You know, I wonder the same thing. So when I was in this situation, you know, about 14 years ago, looking for child care. The cost of it was astronomical then. You know, I, I think about how much we were paying to send our two kids to, to daycare uh, there in Tuscaloosa and then Birmingham and um, how challenging it would have been to make ends meet um, had we not had a nest egg set aside. And so you think about all of those people who are working diligently to, to make it work. And you think about, um, you know, for those parents who have the opportunity to stay home and wanna do that, that is incredible. But for those men and women who want to enter our workforce, we wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. And so whether it is cost or availability. It seems like we are failing um, on both sides. So Alabama, as you well know, is a more rural state. And I know that we have essentially uh, rural child care deserts um, scattered all around Alabama, even in our urban areas, as you heard me allude to from my own personal experience, the cost is just unsustainable. And so how we got here is likely because there were not enough women like Patty Worry or myself at the table being able to speak directly into this, bringing it to light and um, showing the nation that it's certainly something that we have to solve. And so I look forward to continuing to be a part of the conversation. I'm clearly new here and have been here about 16 months, know that there's a lot to learn, but 
when I think about experiences like my own or like my family members um, or the constituents whose stories I hear, um, I know that doing nothing is not an option. And so we've got to figure out there and how to do something, how to do something and certainly how to do it together. Thanks for that. Uh, Senator Murray, how did we get here to this point? It's such a good question. Thank you. And it's great to be on with my friend, Senator Britt, who's on my committee and a, a great partner to work with on many issues. How did we get here? Because our nation has never seriously taken the issue of child care as an inc uh, incredibly important foundation to our economy. So it has been a silent problem for many, many years. Parents just struggled with it. They either didn't take a job or they left the job market or they had childcare that wasn't safe. They didn't want to complain about it because if they complained, it would they were worried that their boss wouldn't hire them or promote them because childcare was a problem for them. So it was really just a silent issue and one that our country never took seriously. You know, in, in this country, we know that we have to invest in the infrastructure of roads and bridges and highways. They're critical to our economy working. We have to look at child care as the same thing, because if people don't have the ability to know their child is in a safe place where they are secure, they can't do a good job at work or they're not working. That hurts our economy, it hurts our families individually, it hurts our communities. I believe that how we get out of this is by our country finally taking seriously childcare as a basic infrastructure investment for our country, for all of us. Thank you for that, Senator Murray. Um, and Ms. Hamilton, I wanna ask you, what have you found in, the, in your research and survey data, I know I'll do the annual kids count um, about the cost of child care, but also what are some major pain points for families? Thank you both uh, senators for championing this cause and for trying to help us all understand how we get here. Um, as Senator Britt said, the two biggest challenges here are around um, affordability and access. And I'm happy to talk about this affordability issue. Um, based on um, survey data, it looks like the average cost of childcare is about $11,580 a year um, for families. There are about 25, chil 25 million children under the age of five um, in this country, and about half of the um, people who work today are parents. So this is, uh, as Senator Murray ex explained, quite a significant issue and a, a huge infrastructure issue for our country. Um, the cost varies across the country, as one could imagine. In Senator Britt's um, home state, um, the average cost is about $7,900. That is about a tenth of a married couple's income, but a third of a single mother's income. Um, HHS, the Health, Health and Human Services Department, recommends that um, child care costs about 7% of um, household income. So if we've got families contributing north of 30% of their income to child care, that is the definition of unaffordable for many families. If we turn to Senator Murray's home state, um, the cost of childcare there averages about $15,000. Um, again, more than a third of a single mother's income in that state and about an eighth of a married couple. So um, it's abundantly clear that um, the average cost of care is far beyond what um, average families can afford. Um, a recent Department of Labor study showed that there are only 50 counties in the whole country where the median household income can meet that 7% um, uh, amount of childcare. So it, it is really um, quite unaffordable across the country. And the last data point I'll give that we often find astounding is that um, the cost of child care in this country for, for young infants costs more than in-state college tuition in 34 states. Mm -hmm. um, and when you've got a young child, you haven't had the ability to save for 18 years to prepare for them to enter child care. So we're talking about families that are typically in the beginning of their career, aren't making as much money are quite burdened by the cost of childcare alone, not to mention the other costs um, that are rising for families around housing and food, et cetera. Um, so affordability is a huge issue we've got to address in this country. Thanks so much for all those important data points that really drive the point home. And you know, uh, so many 
families across the country know those very well uh, from their personal experience. Let's sort of move on to talking to, about some solutions or potential solutions. Uh, Senator Murray, I believe you've introduced the Child Care for Working Families Act every year since 2017. Uh, what's your case for how that would help families and why hasn't it passed? Um, well, first of all, let's understand why we have a crisis. Um, as has been said, we have an access, we have an affordability. Um, we, we have to address all parts of this. Access is, is there a slot available? And oftentimes a slot is not available because there isn't a facility. So my legislation actually provides grants to communities to actually build the facilities so you have a place where kids can go. Secondly, affordability is a key issue. We just heard Lisa talk about that. So what our legislation does is cap out-of-pocket costs for families at 7% so that it becomes affordable. That means more kids will be in our, our child care centers, and it means that we will have uh, more income for those child care centers, centers, centers to stay open. And finally, we address the issue of pay. We pay our child care workers nothing. So I have talked to numerous families who, um, who you know, you want to send your kids someplace where you know they're secure. And if the child teacher or child care worker is turning over every other month because they can go work at McDonald's for more money, you don't feel good about sending your child there. So keeping those professionals in those jobs for the stability of that means paying them a wage that actually keeps them um, professional and at those jobs. So our legislation goes at all three of those things. And capping uh, out-of-pocket expenses for, for all families that know more than 7%, I think you said, of their income uh, <laughs> probably sounds pretty good to a lot of folks. So what's been the impediment uh, to, to getting that through Congress in various different compositions of Congress over that time? Yes, and, I, and I've introduced it, as you talked about, for several years now. And the good news is, is we're growing support. We have more supporters for that today, both in Congress, uh, co-sponsors of our legislation, and nationally. More and more co coalitions are coming together to say this is the kind of solution we need. Um, so that outside support is really critical. Everything from child care advocates, obviously, to parents themselves, to professional organizations, to even businesses who realize their bottom. Uh, line, bottom dollar line is impacted because they can't get the workers they need. So we are broadening that coalition, continuing to work on it, and I think we have the possibility to get it passed. We will need bipartisan support in the Senate. Uh, right now we have, I believe it's 42, 43 co-sponsors who are Democrats. We're reaching across the aisle and looking to uh, get Republican support for as well. But I am determined, Dan. This is what I think we need to do to, again, as I said before, look at child care as an infrastructure need. How do we build that and make sure it's there so that our economy will be able to be productive for all families? Thanks. And Senator Britt, uh, you know, I believe there hasn't been Republican support for the proposal that Senator Murray was talking about. Uh, could you speak to why that is uh, and or what would be better from your perspective than the solution that she's proposing with other yeah. Democrats? So um, obviously, Senator Murray has done a tremendous job in this area, uh, digging in, figuring out what are, you know, what are the issues and, and how do we solve them? I would say, um, a couple of things when you look at it. I would love to take a look at the piece of legislation and really kind of sort of dig in and and, and wrap my head around it and figure out, you know, where um, where our um, different thoughts overlap and, and kind of sort of where I have questions. One of the things I'm always concerned about when it does come to spending, Senator Murray has done a tremendous job. So Senator Murray is the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, she, along with Vice Chair Collins, Susan Collins, have really uh, managed the Appropriations Committee in a way that it has not been done in, in quite some time. We finished all of our bills um, uh, was on, from a committee standpoint by July 27th of this past year. Unfortunately, we didn't get those signed into law until 236 days later. So when it comes to spending and you look at that and you look at the 7% and how you offset that, you know, having yet another industry that is waiting on Congress to do its job when we haven't actually passed all 12 bills on time, when we're talking about a discretionary standpoint uh, since 1997, and the last time we actually passed them individually was 1995, you know, I hesitate to, to tie anything to that. Then when you look at mandatory spending, um, as you all well know, that has continued to grow in this nation. We're 34.5 trillion 
trillion dollars in debt. And when we kind of look at that and look at how not only that's fiscally irresponsible, but morally, morally irresponsible to put on the back of, of these kids. It's like, how do we figure out how to not add to what is now 73% of mandatory spending that we have in this country? So I think probably having not looked at it, my initial thought is, you know, what is what? how do we make this um, work? How are we judicious in it? How are we targeted in the funding and make sure the dollars go to the right place? But I certainly know that all of the things that she just talked about um, are, are critical. I'd say also making sure that, you know, small businesses, you know, we, we're, we're thoughtful about how these kinds of things impact them. Um, she mentioned affordability. She mentioned obviously making sure that this is treated like the profession that it is. And she mentioned about the turnover over and over again. I have a family member who just pulled their children out of a child care facility for that very reason. You know, there is no greater gift, in my opinion, um, in, in this world than, you know, having that opportunity to, to, to be a parent. And so you take it, you, you don't take it lightly. And so you want to make sure that your child is in good hands. So um, I think apprenticeship programs, amongst other things, and driving people um, into this career path and making sure they're paid accordingly. I'd say the last thing, too, is just parents. You know, we want to make sure not only um, that, that the workers are, are paid accordingly, but also that, that it, we find a way to drive costs down for parents. So most definitely, um, we'll certainly take a look at that and look forward to talking to Senator Murray about it. Thanks. And I, I think we'll we'll dive into some more particular potential solutions in a minute, but I just wanted to ask Senator Murray if, if she wanted to respond on the spending question at all. Yeah, Dan, I mean, I think what I heard Katie saying is it's a great idea, but it's going to cost us something. Yeah, we, and when you invest in infrastructure, it does cost something. But I think what we have to, how we have to look at the child care crisis is that according to actually a, a Ready Nation report, um, the lack of child care cost $122 billion in lost earnings, productivity, and revenue each year. So right now, our country is losing revenue because we don't have a child care infrastructure. So we have to look at it that way. How do we pay for it? Well, there's, there's lots of ways to look at this. One opportunity is the Bush tax cuts expire next year, and that will give us an opportunity to go back and say, how do we make sure that our country balances our taxes along with what our needs are? And I think that's where this can be paid for in a very easy way. Okay. All right. So, and I'm taking notes. If you see me looking down, Cynthia is, is my, uh, I do cover education in Alabama. So um, let's go back. Senator Murray, I want to ask you a question. You were a state legislator before becoming ago. a U.S. Sen senator. And what's something that maybe you saw working at the local level in Washington state um, that you think should be expanded uh, nationally? I think Seattle has a public preschool program, you know, and I, as Senator Britt, I do want to hear, um, I know some good things that are working in Alabama also, but can you talk to us? Have you seen something that you'd like to expand nationally? Well, I, I think my legislation is actually based on some of the things that Washington State has been trying to do. But what we have found is that because this is a national issue and because um, we, we can only do incremental things at the state level, we really have to look at this as the United States of America. What, what do we want for our country? We want us to be productive. We want our economy to work well. We want our kids to be taken care of and be in safe places. And that's why I believe it's going to take national legislation. My state legislature has tried to do a number of things and, and help out in small ways. But I really think this has to be, and what is the United States of America doing about a national crisis um, that we have to all be part of solving at the national level? And Senator Britt, basically the same question. Um, you know, have you seen anything that is working in Alabama that you think could be expanded nationally? Looking for looking for solutions, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and Trish, nobody knows them better than you. So I should really turn that question back over to you. But I have always been really proud of our first class pre-K. First class, first class pre-K. We have been number one in the nation, I believe, for the last 18 consecutive years. And I am a 
big believer, obviously, in um, and getting to a child early and giving them an opportunity to thrive. I mean, we know that the first, what is it, 1,000 days of a child's life, you know, I think something of those sorts, 95% of their brain forms, you know that, you know, you, by eighth, by third grade, um, if you're not reading on grade level, your chance of graduating high school goes down significantly. We, we kind of sort of know the, the pattern that happens here. And so I think first class pre-K in Alabama gives students an opportunity to learn their sounds and their letters and their colors and all of the things and be even more prepared when they go to kindergarten. Because if you think about a child who comes to kindergarten um, and by no fault of their own has never been taught those things, then if we have to catch them up from five to eight, um, it, that's a significant jump. And so the earlier we're able to get that educational instruction and um, just a great environment with with children, I think is significant. I think it pays dividends long long term. And I've been really proud of, of the work that we've done there. And I know Alabama just passed, um, you know, uh, some new tax credits, which you, you could explain better than I do, but I'm looking forward to seeing how that works, how it works incentivizing the employer, you know, to contribute to their employees, childcare, and then also, you know, incentivizing childcare providers, whether it is increasing wages, whether it is driving down costs, whether it is improving improving infrastructure. So obviously time will tell on that, but I was really proud, you know, about the significance of it and, and what all works and, and, and works, works well. But I was really proud of the Alabama legislature for stepping up and engaging in that and um, excited to see the positive dividends that come from it. Yes, I'll be following that closely as well. I mean, it was kind of unusual for Alabama, right, um, as a state. So I think, Daniel, you'd like to ask Ms. Hamilton a question. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Hamilton, to bring it back to you, uh, you know, you're not going to comment on a particular legislation, but but what's a bright spot that you're working on or that, that the foundation has seen recently across the country that you think communities should be considering? Sure. I, I, I certainly um, think that some of the issues uh, Senators Murray and Britt have raised around um, uh, tax credits for um, individual families, whether that's the earned income tax credit or the uh, child independent care credit, those certainly go to help um, families cover the cost, um, the ways that credits can incentivize employers um, to support their employees' um, costs or to create on-site child care centers, which we are seeing as well. Um, there's still a significant amount of money um, in pandemic relief that states can still access to do things like supplement workers' wages. Um, but some of the more innovative things we've seen have been around how to address the business model challenges of child care. Our child care is not a, a, a comprehensive system like our public education system. It's um, the, the aggregation of thousands of um, small proprietors and, and large um, child uh, care centers that are providing these services. And um, one of the things we've heard is that increasing rents makes it difficult for child care providers um, to operate their businesses on even the thin margins this industry has. So we've heard about um, a real estate investment trust, a REIT, that is purchasing um, uh, facilities and making them available to child care providers. They're doing the upgrades to make them compliant with local regulations, uh, but they're also able to provide stable rents for those um, uh, entrepreneurs so that they can um, maintain their businesses at a reasonable cost for families. So there are lots of different ways, whether it's government tax credits, whether it's employers who are stepping up and providing um, on-site daycare or innovative ways we can help entrepreneurs enter this market through um, capital or through um, more stable real estate um, availability. Well, that's interesting to, to talk about uh, the, the real estate angle and, and rents as well. Um, I think let me jump in here, unless you had a follow-up, Trish. Did you want to follow up on something? No, not on that. I was I was moving to the uh, next question about common ground. Um, this is one of my favorite questions. I always like to find common ground. Um, Senator Britt, starting with you, where do you think you can find common ground with Democrats on child care? Um, I, I think there's actually probably a, a lot of places, to be honest with you. And Trisha, I just want to tell you, I thank you for that question, because it is my belief that um, where we share a common goal 
even if we have different ideas about how we achieve that goal, um, it is encumbered upon us as elected leaders to sit in a room and figure out a pathway forward. And too often, I believe the media focuses on the places where we don't agree versus trying to find the places. And, and, and by media, I mean media, social media, people, all, all of the above, um, find the places where we, um, where we do and figure out how to move those forward. Um, Senator Murray probably has a better idea of the different touch points, but I think the things that um, she has worked on, obviously, with Head Start and working on making sure that that's there, I think taking a look probably at where the poverty level is and the drop off from the poverty level to, um, to assistance to non assistance, um, you know, that is obviously not sustainable. If, if you just look at that, that number, um, somebody making, you know, 25,000, you know, wh whatever it is, $800 a, a month um, to someone who's just making $200 more than that at 26 thousand dollars a year, excuse me, not a month, but a year. Um, I think there's probably common ground, obviously, there. And how do we figure out how to help um, low income individuals get there? Um, I think, obviously, rural communities and making sure that we support, um, incentivize uh, the opening of child care facilities in more rural communities, I think, is something we certainly come together on. Um, finding ways is, finding ways to, to figure out how to drive up wages and incentivize people into a career path um, and obviously such an important one, forming young minds and um, being an educator, whether it is a caretaker from the beginning or an educator later in life is so critically important to the next generation um, and, and figuring out how to make that be sustainable. Um, so I'm, I am confident that there are many places when it comes to affordability and accessibility where we overlap and I am committed to where those places are to figuring out how to move them forward and where we have different opinions, sitting down and understanding the different perspective um, so that we can see if we can navigate through that to ultimately achieve what we need to, which is a better childcare community better opportunities, um, more resources um, for people who want to re-enter the workforce. I look at a place like Alabama, and Trish, you know this, our labor participation rate is not where it needs to be. You know, it's what, 57.5% or something right around there. It's five points lower than the national average. And if if childcare, to Senator Murray's earlier point, is an impediment to people entering the workforce, we need to remove that impediment. So I feel good about being able to find common ground in many spaces in this area. Thank you, thank you. And Senator Murray, same question to you. Where do you think you could find common ground with Republicans? Well, I think I would answer you that that's what we're doing. And in fact, in the appropriations bill that we finally just passed, um, there's a number of areas where we did find common, common ground. I was able to increase the CCDBG block grants, which are block grants to individual states for childcare. Uh, they determine where the money goes, but it is for all parts of childcare by a billion dollars in this last appropriations bill. That's what happens when you have a woman as chair of this committee. <laughs> Um, but we also, look, I looked across the board throughout appropriations and said, where can we make a difference? So for example, in, in the military construction side of the appropriations bill, one of the things I have seen is that on our military bases, we have a horrific lack of supply for childcare. We're asking men and women to go and fight for our nation and they're leaving their kids in unsafe places. There isn't access for them. So I made a major investment in our military construction and in our military bills to help make sure we're addressing the crisis on our bases. I looked at the VA budget, something I care passionately about is our veterans. And the fact is that we have an increasing number of women who are veterans today who should get, be getting their health care through the VA and through the VA services that they have earned. But they are not accessing it because they go to that VA facility. There is no child care available for them. And I will tell you as a woman, if you can't take care of your kids, you're not going to go into your medical appointment. So we are making an investment in, um, in access for child care at our VA facilities so women veterans will do a better job of taking care of their health and we can help them with that. Even here in, in Congress, in this last legislation, uh, I increased access for our thousands of employees who work here for access so that they can be at the work at the long and horrible hours that we require of them and have better access for childcare. So I look in every single place and reach across the aisle and say, will you help me with this part of it? Um, we talked about tax credits a minute ago. 
uh, I'm actually co-sponsor of some tax credit legislation. I don't think that will address every part of it. And you certainly have to look at how it's written. It makes a huge difference on how that happens. But I, I will look for any way that we can to help increase the affordability uh, and the availability for child care, because I believe it's that strongly it's important to our country. Hey, and if I may add one thing to that, she she is not joking. I, I was was proud, voted for each one of those bills that she's talking about there in appropriations. But I brought to Vice Chair Collins. I had visited troops and heard about the child care, just um, the challenges that our men and women in uniform are facing both at home and, and abroad and brought that to her. And she said, we're on it. Patty's on it. Um, so really appreciate the work that's being done in those areas. Thanks to you both. Um, we're going to soon pivot to some audience questions, but before we do that, you know, when Trish and uh, I write about child care and other child care reporters, you know, we talk to a lot of parents who say, you know, how is this possible that we have these challenges? This is our future, you know, of our country. Uh, we need to be doing more. And also sometimes we hear from from uh, from readers or from people commenting on stories about government subsidies and incentives for child care. And they say, well, I don't have kids. Uh, you know, um, why should I care about this? Why should my tax money go in this direction? Or they may even say, uh, bring up family planning and say parents uh, who can't afford kids shouldn't be having kids. What's your reaction to some of those uh, to some of those voices and, and comments? Uh, and can we start with Senator Britt, perhaps? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me the last part of your question? Sure. Just, uh, you know, we get comments from people who, who don't have kids, don't want to see their, their tax money spent on child care or, or, or say, well, parents uh, should be family planning. If they can't afford kids, they shouldn't have them. Uh, what's your reaction to those kind of comments? Look, I um, believe in supporting moms in the prenatal, the postpartum, and the early childhood development ages. Um, and so certainly as a nation, we have to figure out how we support and make markets work for the people that um, that use them. And if you look at our even our birth rate right now, it's the lowest it's been, I think, since 1979. And you can look at the numbers. I'm sure you'll probably reported on them of what that means for us 20 years, 50 years out, um, what that means for the overall economy. So, you know, my goal is not listening to that, but certainly doing what we need to do to create a market that actually works, to put parents back in the driver's seat where they have um, opportunity in front of them, where we can create solutions that allow them to be able to care for their child in the way that they need to um, and also contribute to the greater good um, you know, whether, no matter what uh, field they're working in. So that's my goal. Thanks. Uh, Senator Murray, did you want to speak to any of those type of comments that we, you know, sure. almost always uh, get? I mean, I've had, I've had people walk up to me and say, I don't have kids. Why should I pay for this? My answer is pretty simple. Do you go to work every day? Do you have an income? Well, if you want your uh, company to stay open, then you need workers there. And the less workers you have, the less productive you can be. And one of the biggest reasons we don't have productivity today is because people can't be in the workplace because they don't have childcare. So we will help lower costs for all Americans if we can be more productive. We will have a better educated workforce that can support that worker regardless of whether they have children or not when they retire. We will have a, a workforce that is more innovative and creative and entrepreneurial if we can make sure that there is childcare for those workers to be at work, which helps every single American. Yeah. Could I weigh in on that as well? As a leader of a foundation focused on a bright future for children, I absolutely think we all have a vested interest in making sure that we have a childcare system that works for everyone, certainly for um, parents so that they can support themselves and their children for employers who need the talent both today and parents and the talent of those children tomorrow um, that need to be in early education settings um, and for the overall health of our economy. 40% of the uh, moms who aren't in the workplace aren't uh, working because of childcare barriers and we certainly don't want their talent left on the sidelines. And I'll note one issue that hasn't come up recently is about the impact of childcare on children. Um, we want to make sure that children are 
ready to learn when they start kindergarten, that they're prepared to be um, uh, prepared to excel in school. And a topic we're all talking about now is pandemic learning loss. And unfortunately, when there isn't childcare available, parents have to make really tough choices. And sometimes they're making the choice to have older siblings stay home to care for younger children, which means those children aren't in school and aren't learning. So we need to be concerned about this, all of us, for today's workers and for tomorrow's workers and our economy for the long term. I want to just add to that because one of the most passionate advocates for my legislation has been law enforcement um, anecdotally. And the reason is, is because they know that kids who are not taken care of, that are in unsafe situations, that don't have the early learning that Senator Britt talked about that's so important, are the ones who end up in our jails and they cost all of us. This is an investment that works across the board and it's really critical that we um, take this on. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. I always love to know, you know, how can we, those children, those people who don't have children, it does matter. Uh, this question will impact all of us. Okay, we're gonna pivot to audience questions. So please put your questions in the comments below. Um, the first question we have is from the audience. Ms. Hamilton, I'm going to ask you your, your uh, input first. Um, this is from Lacey Hanson-Wood. <laughs> She's a teacher of the deaf from Eastern Alabama who specializes in serving children from birth to age five. And the question is, you know, what are we doing for our young children with special needs? That is an absolutely important question. And while I don't have the data, I imagine that childcare costs for those children who might have um, specific medical uh, care needs or, or need teachers who are specifically trained to care for them, I can't imagine how much more childcare is going to cost for them. So I think um, this general conversation we're having about childcare costs is um, probably even more intense for families that are trying to find care for special needs children. So I appreciate that question and think that we've got to make sure we've got a child, child care system that's working for um, the range of um, experiences and needs that all of our children have. Thank you for that. Senator Murray or Senator Britt, do you want to add anything to that? Do you know of, you know, what do we what do we do? I mean, that's a population of parents that I talk with a lot is parents of kids with special needs. And it is really difficult to find, to find child care. It is heartbreaking when you have all the medical costs of a special needs child, and yet you can't go to work to have, earn the income you need to take care of that child because specifically you can't find child care for special needs. So yes, it is something that we have to think about in terms of everything we do in terms of access that we are making sure that we think about how this impacts parents and, and special needs kids as we write that legislation or make those investments. Yes, and obviously um, having worked significantly with the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind there in East Alabama know how critically important that is to families and to make sure that um, that they have the resources needed and, and have been proud to continue to support the work that's done there. Uh, Senator Murray and I have two colleagues, at least that I know of, that have, that have shared their experience of, of raising a child with special needs and, you know, kind of the, the different um, maybe challenges that that are presented in in how to care for that child and enter the workforce and and do and care for other children in in the same space and so um i think that you know one of the reasons that i love being in the senate is everybody has a different perspective they come from a different walk of life and if we take some time and listen to those things and we can really learn so certainly leaning into our colleagues that ha that have that experience and then the constituents that also do i think is what we need to do as we challenge or ch you know chart a path forward thank you for that thank you for that um i you know we didn't we are not getting to a lot of audience questions but i do appreciate the your various perspectives i think it adds a lot to the conversation i see a lot of things that i hope i'm reporting on in the near future um and so i think we're going to move to final comments um we've covered a lot of ground and a lot of ground all over the place. And could you each, and we'll start with Senator Britt, would you please share a final thought about how we can make our nation's child care system more functional, accessible, 
and affordable for families in the days ahead. Senator yes. Bennett. Absolutely. Well, once again, thank you all for putting this um, together. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to sit alongside Senator Murray, who's been a leader in this area uh, for, for years and has blazed a trail um, so that we can continue, not, not have to start the conversation, but be able to continue it. Um, I really believe we've got to put parents back in the driver's seat. We've got to make sure, obviously, that there are uh, affordable options, there are quality options, and um, that we are supporting the market, allowing it to work so that we, um, so that people actually have a shot to send their child somewhere where they're going to be loved and cared for, where they're going to feel good about it, where it's going to be sustainable, where they can re-enter the workforce and, um, and actually be able to thrive. You know, when you listen to the costs that we've talked about on just this, on this Zoom and you, hear the impediment to achieving the American dream um, as a result of the cost of child care, you know we have to do something. So I would say putting parents back in the driver's seat, um, creating a market that works, um, thinking about our rural communities. You know, a lot of times it's easy to think about how kind of some of the bigger businesses can can take part in this, but figuring out how do we bring small businesses together so that that workforce that's so critically important in our main streets that make so many of our communities who they are, where where their workers um, can take part in these types of things as well, I think is really um, important, but look forward to continuing to be a part of the uh, conversation, making sure that uh, we know that every family's journey is different, and we just want to make sure that they're in charge of charting that path and that they have um, a pathway to success. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Senator Murray, and then we'll hear from Ms. Hamilton. Senator Murray, anything, final comments? Look, I, I have to say we have come a long way uh, since I first tried to start talking about this, and it was like, oh, God, there she goes again. <laughs> now everybody really understands the impact on our economy. I think I, I, I am going to work as hard as I can on the legislation I described earlier to make sure that we look at this as a broad problem that we have to address affordability, accessibility, and teacher quality, and we have to make it a, uh, a solution that our nation looks at as an infrastructure investment. I'm excited about the opportunity for this. Next year, the Trump tax cuts expire. It gives us the opportunity to build this kind of infrastructure capacity that will help grow our economy, help families in a real way, and really make sure that our businesses can thrive because they will have the workforce there that's there that can be confident at, at work every day. As I say all the time, you only do as good a job at work as you know how your child is doing wherever they are. Let's make sure that all of our workers can be at work, do the best job they can, and that our nation thrives in the future. So I'm looking forward to working on that. Thank you. And Ms. Hamilton. Well, I think we all tried to make it clear this is an all hands on deck moment, that this is an issue that matters for every single American, and that there's a role for every sector to play in helping us solve these issues. There's clearly a role for government um, in a variety of ways we've talked about. Um, in other wealthier countries, they spend $14,000 a year on um, making sure their youngest children are safe and prepared. In the United States, we spend about $500. So we are woefully behind in investing in this valuable infrastructure for our country. It matters for parents, it matters for employers, it matters for our economy, and it matters for children. And so I hope that we'll all take this moment to figure out how we can be most creative in all sectors, whether it's government, business, entrepreneurs, um, and parents to work together to get a solution that's going to last for the long term. Thanks to all, all three of you for those thoughts and for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. And apologies to the audience members with more questions. We thought we'd have a little bit more time for that, but we have senators here who need to take some <laughs> votes. Yes, uh, we do. So yeah. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us and a recording will be available uh, to share by our newsrooms. This is uh, on behalf of the Seattle Times, AL.com and the Education Reporting Collaborative. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.